Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Community Composting Done Right, A Guide to Best Management Practices with Linda Bilsons Brolis. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. And we're very pleased to be able to offer this webinar. It's one in a series we offer to advance composting. And we just love to share working models and tips for replication. As uh, many of you know, we focus on supporting a distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting. Um, as the next slide um, shows, uh, we are convening the sixth national cultivating community composting forum in New York City. If you're a community composter, we hope you can participate and early registration ends today at midnight. So don't delay, sign up. It's gonna be awesome. Four days, it's the first time we're doing this as a standalone event. And four days, we're the first days of full day training at Earth Matter and Governor's Island, which if you haven't been there, would be worth it to come for that alone. And then Sunday, we have five different tours of New York City community compost sites. And the link there, um, go to the link and there's a list of all the sites uh, that will be on each of those tours. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. And then the following two days, uh, May 13th and 14th, we're having an in-person forum. There'll be so much opportunity to network and talk to your peers. So check it out if you aren't already signed up. Um, we have a, a, a lot of other resources. And one thing we just did a beta launch of, ooh, I think last week is our new composting for community map. There's a link there. And it's designed as an interactive map featuring composters, community composters that is, and policies to support them. We did a soft launch on this. So we're just mentioning it today. Check it out, give us your feedback. And if you're a community composter and you're not on the map, let us know. But we only have a little bit more than 50 and we have like more than 200 or so to add to it. So don't don't worry, we'll get to you. Um, again, as I mentioned, this, this webinar today is one of a series. Um, here's just to give you a, a sense of some of the other webinars we've been hosting. Most of them focus on how to support a um, community scale, uh, community-based um, composting. We've done one on Bokashi. We have one on policies and legal issues. We did a spotlight on bike-powered food scrap collection. We've done one just on worm composting. The last one we did, which actually is shown here, was uh, with James McSweeney talking about his new book, Community Scale Composting Systems. And um, we have one Actually, next week, this one is a closed webinar. It's only really available if you're a community composter, so it's by invitation only, but it's on, uh, we'll be featuring a community compost company, Compost Now, Let Us Compost, and it's really on hauling and vehicle permits and the challenging some of these community scale composters are facing. So if you are facing challenges, contact Virginia Streeter, um, and we'll see if we can get you logged on to participate in that. Um, so um, without further ado, let me focus on why we're here today, which is to talk about community composting done right, a guide to best, best management practices. And today's webinar is, is uh, based on the report of the same title, which we released a few weeks ago. Linda uh, Bilsons Brolis is the lead author. I co-authored it with her, but she's definitely the lead. And I just wanna emphasize that we, relied on a lot of colleagues to give us review and input. And of course, we featured a number of actual community composting sites and some of the best practices we like there. So shout out to all of you. I can't thank, thank everybody individually, neither myself nor Linda, but special shout out to our mentor, Benny Erez at Eco City Farms in Maryland, which together with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, a few years ago, we launched the Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program, and Linda's the project manager for that. And one of the reasons we launched a kind of community scale training program is we found out that that was one of the biggest obstacles to really success on the ground at community scale is you need, we wanna set sites up for success. And so having, people trained and, and, and how to do composting right is really important. And then this guide, which is not a substitute for getting trained, but a companion to that is really, again, to kind of complement um, 
what we're learning on the ground and whatnot. Linda will talk more about that. Linda has been working with me since 2013. She, as I said, manages the Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program, which we launched in 2014. And it's really designed to be adapted and replicated as a model for community composting around the country. Um, so if you're interested, contact one of us on our team, and we would love to help bring it to your community. Linda is a certified compost facility operator in the state of Maryland, and she has also trained with the internationally renowned Lupkes in Aus Austria, and they specialize in a unique technique that enhances the humus content and quality of compost. So not all compost is created equal. Um, I do, before I turn it over to Linda, and we can start sharing her screen now, um, just to get that up and running. But I just want to remind everybody, one, that you can type in your questions at any time, and we'll get to th those at the end. Linda will talk for about an hour, which will leave us 30 minutes for Q&A. Um, and before she gets started, I just also want to uh, do a shout out to our funders, which uh, we've had several in particular for this project, EPA Region 4, out of headquartered out of Atlanta and working in the Southeast. Thank you so much. 11th Hour Project, Lisa and Douglas Goldman Fund, and Virginia Curtella Mars Foundation were our lead funders. Thanks to all of our donors. We couldn't do this work without you. So Linda, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Brenda. All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for everyone's favorite topic, composting best management practices. Uh, as Brenda just mentioned, I'm the project manager for ILSR's Composting for Community project, specifically managing the Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program, which we launched back in 2014. And over the last few years, I've been working on adapting the NSR to different communities and helping develop community composting demonstration sites in different places. As a complement to this, I've also been leading our work in developing best management practices for community composting, which has basically culminated in this report. Community Composting Done Right, a guide to best management practices, is designed to support community scale composters in successfully managing their composting process and site. The practices have a particular focus on sites accepting food scraps. The report is divided into three parts and we'll do an overview of them during the course of this webinar. Inspiration for the report was drawn from various sources, including our NSR program, the US Composting Council, the NRAES On-Farm Composting Handbook, the New York Compost Project, the DC Department of Parks and Recreation Compost Cooperative Network, and the broader Community Composter Coalition, which we convene. The report also features custom illustrations by Clarissa Libertelli, a young artist and college student who lent us her talents to this project between classes. You'll see her lovely artwork throughout this presentation. Um, you'll also see the 14 community composters from around the country that are featured in the report, including Eco City Farms, like Brenda mentioned, the Baltimore Compost Collective in Baltimore, the Howard Community Compost Cooperative in Washington, D.C., Red Hook Community Farm, BK Route, and Earth Matter in New York City, Rust Belt Riders in Cleveland, and Sunshine Community Compost in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, the report adapts standards for, of practice from the commercial composting industry for the community scale, and much of the information will apply regardless of the system being used, but it is not intended as a guide for home composting. Before we dive in to this report, here are some of the other reports that the Composting for Community team has released over the last few years. For more information on small-scale composting systems, you'll want to see our forthcoming com companion report to this guide, the BMP guide, um, the forthcoming report is called, will be called Microcomposting, a guide to small-scale and on-site food scrap composting systems. For information on government-supported home composting programs, you'll want to see our May 2018 report, Yes in My Backyard, a home composting guide for local government. And for more information on community composters, see our 2014 report, Growing Lo Local Fertility, a guide to community composting. Let's begin uh, quickly by defining community composting. Growing local fertility, we outline, in growing local fertility, we outlined how community composting keeps the process and product as local as possible while engaging the community through participation and education. Uh, in the report, we categorized community composting initiatives into 10 main types based on either the type of venue, such as school or farm, or the type of operation, such as collector and composter. 
uh, community composters can and often do fall into more than one of these categories. But at this relatively small scale, compost is produced and used within the same community in which the material is generated. Community composters represent a wide range of initiatives in different venues using different systems, from in-vessel systems at schools to custom-built three-bin options at urban farms. As composting systems can be tailored to meet different levels of available time and effort, community composting programs range in size, but they have a common goal to serve a given community within a closed resource loop. This is our hierarchy to reduce food waste and grow community that we released back in 2017. It highlights the importance of locally based composting solutions. Composting can be small scale and large scale and everything in between, but too often home composting, on-site composting, community scale composting, and on-farm composting are overlooked. Community composting is encompassed in the small scale decentralized level of the hierarchy. Well run, community composting demonstration sites are critical to improving people's understanding of what good compost is and how it's made. These sites can help garner support from the general public and policymakers for composting at all scales. Community composters help to make composting more accessible to the public, but with this comes greater visibility and sometimes scrutiny. While composting is a natural age-old practice, it is also a science and an art. To produce high quality mature compost without creating nuisance odors and attracting pests takes forethought, attentiveness, and practice. Compost site operators need to know how to optimize certain conditions to avoid problems, regardless of the size of the site or the volume of material being processed. Training and learning from more experienced composters is one key to success. It's for these reasons, as Brenda mentioned, that we created the NSR program, um, and the NSR program developed this set of best management practices and monitor, uh, for monitoring and uh, composting. Those small-scale composters are often exempt from certain state permitting or local zoning requirements, it is still critically important that they follow best management practices. To ensure composting remains a viable option, particularly in urban settings, we all have to strive for high quality compost without nuisances. The biggest challenge in writing this guide was creating a resource that was both broad enough to encompass all the different types of community composting or op operations that exist, while also creating something that drilled down deep enough to be useful. But although certain practices will change depending on the scale or, lo or location of your operation or whether you are solely volunteer run or not, the basic science behind the composting process does not change. However, the materials you want to compost and what you want to do with the finished product will determine the level of BMPs you need to employ. Composters that want to, pre uh, that want to process animal manures or food scraps for more than one household, especially if their goal is to create a finished product that will be used in food production, will need to implement the highest level of best management practices. The BMPs uh, listed here are important regardless of scale, and we'll touch on all of these throughout the course of the webinar. Part one of the report summarizes composting basics, site and site plan considerations, and steps to prepare for composting. So let's dive in. Composting is a natural, practical, and beautiful process that transforms potential waste materials into a valuable end product, compost. With a little guidance and practice, practically anyone can learn to do it. However, it is critical to be intentional from the very beginning. Whenever we intervene in the composting process, we have to take responsibility for it. By concentrating organic materials that decompose readily in one place, it is on us to assure that we're not negatively impacting our neighbors, wildlife, or the environment. Fundamentally, composting is an aerobic process or a process that requires oxygen. We can speed it up by creating the ideal conditions uh, for the organisms responsible for decomposition, and this includes adequate airflow, sufficient moisture, and the right recipe of food. Passive or cold composting is a low effort method of composting that involves little attention or, man or management. It is not appropriate for community sites composting food scraps because this type of composting doesn't reach high enough temperatures to kill weed seeds and pathogens. As such, we don't discuss this type of composting much in the report. Active or hot composting, also referred to as thermophilic composting, is a method of composting that involves more attention to piles so that they achieve higher temperatures, which also results in a faster composting process. Temperatures higher than 104 degrees Fahrenheit are considered thermophilic conditions, but 131 degrees Fahrenheit or higher will be needed to kill weed seeds and pathogens. 
This approach produces a finished product more quickly than passive composting does, and it also requires regularly turning and or aerating composting piles and maintaining adequate moisture. Uh, compost decomposers refer to both microorganisms and macroorganisms. Microorganisms or microbes are the workforce of the composting pile. They chemically transform the raw materials we mix together in our composting piles into stabilized humus. They are too small to see with the naked eye, but as they reproduce, their activity generates heat in the pile. Mic macroorganisms, on the other hand, are larger organisms that mostly act as shredders. They chew materials into smaller pieces that are more accessible to the microbes. So microbes and macroorganisms each play their role and show up at different times during the composting process. Compost requires organic materials, also known as feedstocks, which are the materials our composting microbes will consume. They contain carbon and nitrogen, along with other elements in varying proportions. Carbon and nitrogen are particularly important for composting, uh, for composting microbes to thrive and do their work. Microbes need a balanced diet of carb carbon for energy and nitrogen to grow and reproduce. And like us, they also need water and air to live. Greens and browns are helpful categorizations of materials that are either relatively high in nitrogen, in the case of greens, or carbon for browns. For community-based projects wanting to compost animal manures or food scraps collected from more than one household, especially for producing compost for local food production, active management will be needed. Active management includes following BMPs for avoiding pests, and nuisance odor issues and meeting the process to further reduce pathogens or PFRP guidelines. And we'll get to these practices in a moment. Composting sites that process food scraps need at least one designated composting site manager to keep track of everything happening on the site, people, materials, etc. Someone will also need to manage the composting system itself to make sure the composting process is doing what you want it to. Perhaps these roles are filled by the same person, but perhaps not. These individuals can be responsible for training other managers, site participants, and volunteers. A group of managers will lighten the load on any one person. Paying managers to do this work is ideal in order to ensure that people stay engaged and that the composting process remains a top priority. Trained composters who are de dedicated and responsible are an asset. Managing a composting project can be hard work and volunteers may not be as accountable as someone who is paid. High turnover and having to spend significant time retraining new managers can be the downfall of a project. Paying composters a living wage helps legitimize and build pride in this work while also investing in a community-based economy. And employing local residents, particularly those most often marginalized, builds local wealth and helps shift entrenched power dynamics. Composting is a skill best learned from a mentor who's been doing it for many years. If you don't already have a mentor, many communities have master gardener programs, which may teach a module on composting. Some communities even have a dedicated master composter program. If your community doesn't yet have a master composter program, our NSR program was designed to be replicated. Uh, the US Composting Council also hosts regular compost operations training courses in different locations throughout the country and throughout the year. Once your team is trained, it's time to develop a management plan. Outline all of the steps of the composting process and sketch out who will be responsible for what. If you don't have a budget for equipment to help with mixing and turning, building new piles and turning existing piles is likely to be the most labor intensive part of your project. Be realistic about what your team can manage and start small and simple. Next, you'll wanna turn your attention to your physical site, making sure it has space for every step of the composting process. The physical characteristics of your compost site and local laws and regulations will influence how you lay out the components of your site, what system you employ, and what site-specific management practice you'll need. Community composters don't always have much of a choice as to where to set up their composting system, so they have to do the best with what they have. The report outlines characteristics of an ideal community composting site, but modifications can and should be made to make less than ideal sites work. Compost production is optimized when materials are moved in the straightest line possible from start to finish. Ideally, your active composting system will be found in the middle with space for mixing and moving around. Access to water and electricity are important considerations and equipment and tools will require storage and easy access. 
Paved surfaces work well for all steps of the composting process, particularly for feedstock mixing areas, uh, actively composting piles, and they also provide a flat surface for building your composting system on. If your site is sloped, your finished or curing piles should always be upslope from any active piles to keep water from flowing through unstable material and contaminating more stable compost. If using windrows, run them down slope so that they don't block the flow of water. Ideally, nothing involved in the composting process, tools, materials, or systems should sit in standing water. Water that directly contacts actively composting materials should never run directly into surface water, growing areas, or stormwater drains. So as Brenda mentioned, this guide was funded in part by a grant from the US EPA Region 4 office to create a resource for community composters in the state of Georgia. So as such, I'll briefly touch on Georgia's composting rules as an example of how community composting is affected by state laws. In Georgia, composting, mulching, and anaerobic digestion facilities are regulated under the Georgia Rules for Solid Waste Management, which are enforced by the Georgia Environmental Protection Division. All composting facilities not explicitly exempted from these regulations either fall under the permit by rule category or required to obtain a solid waste handling permit. Permit by rule operations only need to meet some of the requirements that those seeking a solid waste handling permit do. So most community composters in Georgia will either be exempt from the requirement for a solid waste handling permit or will fall under the permit by rule category. The exemptions are listed here. The feedstocks a compost site accepts will help to determine whether the site is exempt from permit requirements altogether or whether it's considered a permit by a rural site. The feedstock categories that will, most, that will most likely apply to community scale composters are listed here. Here you'll see that Georgia allows composting sites accepting less than 500 tons of source separated organics and farm residuals a year to operate under a permit by rule. Non-vegetative residuals and manures are not allowed in this category. For more information, see the actual rule, or you can also find a little bit more information in our report. Water is something that needs to be managed on a composting site, and our primary goal is to keep clean water clean. Nothing in the composting process should ever sit in standing water for extended periods of time, as this creates anaerobic conditions or conditions that lack oxygen and create odors. Contact water is any water that has come into contact with raw feedstocks or actively composting material and is a top management priority. Keep contact water from running offsite into surface water and food growing areas. Contact water is not compost tea. It may contain, it may contain pathogens and a high nutrient load, which can damage plants and waterways. Controlling how water comes into contact with the materials on your site is very important. Covering composting piles with roofs, lids, or semi-permeable fabric covers and adding only as much water as is needed will help. Swales, berms, and filters can also help manage stormwater runoff at sites, uh, at sites with a slope and composting piles that are not under a roof. Pests include rats, flies, and any unwanted animals and insects that can act as vectors of pathogens and disease. While areas next to your site may already be attracting pests, think open dumpsters, proper site management can help you keep them off your site. These practices include keeping composting materials secured, never leaving food scraps exposed, excluding meat and dairy from your system, preventing hiding and breeding spots, and general site hygiene. Pest pressure uh, from rats is likely to be higher in urban areas, but other wildlife species vary by geography. You may consider contacting local wildlife specialists to determine what species are present in your area and recommendations for keeping them off your site. As community composters, building a relationship with the community around your composting site must also be a priority. An engaged local community can be an invaluable source of support for your project, be it with labor, resources, or advocacy. Engage your neighbors proactively and intentionally to educate them about proper composting and its benefits. Now that we've got a general plan and a site, it's time to choose an animal resistant composting system. The basic types of composting configurations used by community and farm scale operations are turned windrows, bin systems, aerated static piles, passively aerated static piles, in vessel systems, static piles, and vermicomposting systems. Here on the slide on the upper left, the addition of a blower uh, converts this otherwise passively aerated static pile into an aerated static pile at EcoCity Farms in Edmonston, 
Maryland. Um, in the middle, um, we built, Islas are built Real Food Farm in Baltimore, a five bin compost Knox composting system by Urban Farm Plans back in 2016. Uh, bin systems are pretty common at urban farms. In the upper right, uh, the New York compost project hosted by Big Reuse, Reuse lo located under the Queensboro Bridge, uses a gore cover to convert an otherwise aerated static pile into an in-vessel composting system. For more information on small-scale composting systems, uh, see our upcoming, micro, our upcoming report, Microcomposting, a Guide to Small-Scale and On-Site Composting Systems, as well as James McSweeney's new book, Community Scale Composting Systems, a Comprehensive Practical Guide for Closing the Food System Loop and Solving Our Waste Crisis, which Brenda already mentioned he, uh, he had a webinar with us recently. Uh, so check it out in our resources. Covering your compost is, an, is a very important BMP. Roofs, lids, or impermeable tarps are a good way to keep compost from getting waterlogged, anaerobic, and smelly. Selectively permeable fabric covers or bio covers reduce moisture loss from piles and help keep odors down and animals out of your compost. Selectively permeable covers are fabric covers used to protect actively composting piles, curing piles, and finished compost piles by shedding rainfall but still allowing piles to breathe. Bio covers are thick layers of compost or carbon rich materials like wood chips used as natural air filters to cover actively composting piles. Using a nice thick layer of wood chips, mulch, or other carbon rich materials at the base of your pile will also help soak up any extra moisture and keep your site cleaner and drier. Managing odors and never leaving any exposed food scraps are key to avoiding pests. It is possible to build composting piles out in the open, open even in urban areas. For example, the New York Compost Project hosted at Red Hook Community Farm in Brooklyn successfully uses the windrow method, pictured here. This requires meticulous management to make sure pests are not attracted. Red Hook uses thick layers of more mature compost as bio covers to steal new windrows being built with incoming food scraps. A bio cover can be made with, layer, with a layer of at least two inches of screen compost or at least six inches of unscreen compost. 12 inches of composting overs can also be used, and overs are materials screened out of finishing, uh, screened out of finished compost, and they tend to be lignin-rich materials such as wood chips that don't break down with one pass through the composting system. Um, some of the other important BMPs related to locating your system include ensuring a minimum two-foot clutter-free buffer between your composting system and exterior walls, fences, and shrubs. A minimum of three feet is needed around sidewalks, building foundation, concrete slabs, and footings to keep rodents from burrowing. Setting up your system, including the clutter-free buffer zone on a paved or gravel surface will also help prevent animals from burrowing. A gravel pad should be at least six inches deep and use one inch diameter or larger stones. If you have to place your system directly on the ground, consider using paver stones or hardware cloth to line the inside bottom of the system. Monitor and fix any gaps or holes immediately. Once you have a site design and a system in mind, it's time to assemble your site and get your tools and equipment together. Regardless of your scale and level of the management, you'll need the same, you'll need some basic supplies and tools such as buckets to collect or measure materials, a pitchfork and shovel for mixing and moving material, and shears or sidewalk ice scraper to chop up big materials. If you opt for hot composting, get a temperature probe along with a binder for tracking data. You'll also need a dry, secure space to store your tools that still provides easy access for participants. Determine what green or high nitrogen materials you have available and how you will collect them, how much uh, your chosen system can handle. Know the total capacity of your composting system and your site. Think of this in terms of how much your material how much material your system, system can manage on a weekly or monthly basis. Also consider the capacity of your site for storing browns, which you will need to have readily available on an ongoing basis. Putrescible materials, or materials that degrade readily, such as food scraps, need to be managed with particular care. Ideally, incorporate them into the composting process immediately. Unlike carbon-rich materials, uh, carbon materials, food scraps should not be stored on site. One exception is Bokashi fermented scoops, uh, food scraps. Uh, we have another webinar, as Brenda mentioned, on this topic if you're interested. If you have to store food scraps, 
uh, you should immediately mix them with enough browns to soak up any liquid and prevent anaerobic conditions. They should also be secured from unwanted pests. Animal manures such as chicken, litter, or hamster bedding are not recommended for new composters or sites that are not achieving temperatures above 131 degrees Fahrenheit as they are a potential source of pathogens. That said, they are a great resource for more experienced composters. Having an adequate supply of carbon-rich material on hand is essential when composting wet and putrescible food scraps. Unlike high nitrogen green materials, browns can and should be stored on site in some manner. But even leaves and wood chips require proper storage to avoid them becoming a home for pests. Use properly sealed and fastened lids, bungee cords, combination locks, and other devices to keep things secure. If you keep your browns in open piles, move them around periodically so they don't become a hospitable home for animals. Certain materials can be problematic for new composters and sites that lack active management. Meat, dairy, oil, grease, and animal waste should be avoided in these cases. Diseased or poisonous plants and aggressive weeds are good to avoid, particularly where compost will be used in vegetable gardens. Treated wood and glossy papers may contribute unwanted chemicals. Part two of the report provides a deep dive into the composting pile with an overview of important composting science principles. Regardless of the size of the operation, composting piles will require the same basic inputs and produce the same basic outputs. Fundamentally, composting transforms raw, unstable organic materials into stable organic matter, or compost. Our composting microbes need a balanced diet of carbon and nitrogen, as well as sufficient water and air to thrive. You need to be intentional about the ingredients or feedstocks you feed them. Before building a pile, create a composting recipe based on the feedstocks you have available. Carbon and nitrogen are the most important nutrients for the composting process. To provide, to provide these nutrients in the right proportions, different feedstocks often need to be mixed together. There are a couple of methods to decide how many volumetric parts of each feedstock should be mixed together to provide the needed carbon and nitrogen ratio. A quick rule of thumb for new composters is to use the same size container, such as a wheelbarrow or a bucket, to measure the to measure three parts by volume of brown materials to one part by volume green materials. As discussed previously, browns are relatively carbon-rich materials such as fall leaves, straw and wood chips, and greens are relatively nitrogen-rich materials such as fruit and vegetable scraps, coffee grounds, and garden trimmings. If your composting pile is not heating up as much as you would like using this recipe, try adjusting it uh, to two or, or two and a half parts by volume browns to one part by volume greens. This browns to greens shortcut helps us estimate a compost mix that approximates the ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio. The carbon to nitrogen ratio is the proportion of the dry weight of carbon to the dry weight of nitrogen in the given material. All organic material contains some amount of carbon and nitrogen and therefore has a C to N ratio. This ratio for a given material is determined by laboratory analysis, but lists of general C to N ratios for feedstocks is, are available. The recipe development approach requires that you look up the C to N ratio and average moisture content for each individ individual feedstock you plan to use, estimate the dry weight equivalent of each feedstock material, and then calculate the C to N uh, of the total mix. There are specific formulas for calculating a final C to N ratio for the whole mix, um, and the ideal C to N ratio for an initial composting mixture is between 20 to 1 and 40 to 1 with a target of 25 to 1 to 30 to 1. And the report has more information on this approach and where to find these tables, um, but we have tables 1 and 2 that show uh, some, some common composting feedstock C to N ratios. Given that lab tests can be expensive and that calculating C to N ratios can be complicated and kind of boring, we recommend using the rule of thumb described in method one uh, as a starting place. This rule of thumb often results in a mix with the ideal range of 25 to one to 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio on a dry weight basis. As you practice the art of composting and become familiar with your feedstocks, go ahead and adjust your recipe. Trial and error is definitely part of composting. The needs of our composting microbes are not at all that different from our own. They need food, which we provide with the feedstock recipes we just discussed, 
but they also need sufficient water and air. The bacteria and fungi that drive, drive the process, the composting process, live in a water layer around the organic particles. They rely on that water to move around and eat the feedstocks we've provided them. The ideal moisture range is from 50 to 60% by weight. Composters using active aeration, uh, aerated static piles or ASP systems, will want to aim for 60 to 65% moisture in their initial pile. Below 45% moisture, microbes die or go, go dormant. Excessive moisture is also problematic as water can fill up all available air spaces. Conditions above 70% moisture can lead to water logging and result in anaerobic conditions that can smell and release methane. Airflow is one of the most important factors to manage for successful composting because composting in this is an aerobic process. A good composting recipe will take into account the density of the final mix of feedstocks. Heavy, dense feedstocks have to be balanced with lighter, bulkier feedstocks. Certain brown materials serve as bulking agents that decrease density and increase airspace. A bulking agent is something that improves structure and increases porosity or adds space for air in a pile. Wood chips are a good example. One blend of browns ideal for mixing with food scraps um, that we provide here courtesy of the New York Compost Project hosted at Earth Matter New York is three parts leaves to two parts wood chips or chopped plant stems and one part wood shavings or sawdust. These materials can be mixed together and stored on site. If using method one for estimating the C to N ratio, add two to three parts of this brown mix to every one part green material to create your to create your initial composting mix. After you've collected your feedstocks and decide on your composting recipe, you're ready to measure out your feedstocks and get cooking. Use the same volume container for each of your feedstocks. This can be a five gallon bucket, a wheelbarrow, or the bucket of a skid steer loader or tractor. Regardless of the composting system you employ or the scale of your operation, the basic steps of building a pile are roughly the same. A simple compost pile can be built using a variation of the classic lasagna layer method. This involves building a pile in layers, being careful to add browns and greens in the right volumes, and mixing your green and brown layers all uh, together along with water if needed. We outline the process in more detail in the report, but here are some highlights. Always make sure there's a bio layer of coarse browns like wood chips or straw at the bottom of your pile. A layer four to six inches deep is ideal. Chop up large or whole feedstocks with flat shovel or an ice scraper, though larger operations may opt for a grinding or chipping machine. Add your feedstocks according to your recipe and mix them together. As you mix, use your hand to check the moisture level. It should feel like a wrung out sponge and add water as needed. Repeat these steps as needed until you have a pile that is at least three feet tall, wide, and deep. For active composting to take place, this is the size that you need. If you can't build a pile this size all at once, keep adding material to the pile over time until it's big enough. In the end, each time you finish adding material, cover your pile with a bio layer of compost or browns to keep flies out and smells down. And then a point about mixing. Thoroughly mixing feedstocks at the beginning speeds along the composting process and creates a better finished product with less chance for issues. It also reduces the amount of handling and labor that you'll need later in the process via turning and sifting. The ideal moisture range for a composting mix is between 50 and 60% for static piles and 60 to 65% for aerated piles. How do you determine what your moisture content is? If you take a handful of your composting mix, it should feel like a wrung out sponge. This hand squeeze test is a very quick, easy, and low-tech method for estimating the op approximate moisture content in the field. It involves taking a handful, uh, a number of handful samples from your composting mix and giving them a squeeze. You're looking for basically just a couple of drops to come out between your knuckles as you squeeze. As already mentioned, composting is an aerobic process. It needs air. Bulk density is an estimation of porosity or the ability for air to permeate a material. The starting optimal range for bulk density is between 800 and 1,000 pounds per cubic yard. Check out the report for more information on bulk density. The minimum pile that size that you'll need to support thermophilic composting is 27 cubic feet or one cubic yard, as we mentioned when we were talking about building a pile. 
larger compost piles are better able to self-insulate and can be more readily and can more readily reach higher temperatures than small, smaller piles can. But piles that are built too large can foster air, uh, anaerobic conditions because of compression uh, from a lot of material piling on top. Uh, so those things have to be balanced out. The optimal shape for the composting pile is that of a dome, so that it, or so that it peaks in the middle. The middle of the pile is where the most microbial activity takes place, and thus where most of the heat will build up, as you can see from the illustration here. As long as sufficient porosity exists, hot air will rise from the middle of the pile via convection. Hot air and vaporized water exit from the top of the pile, and also drawing cool, fresh ambient air into the bottom of the pile. This phenomenon is referred to as the chimney effect. Part three of the report outlines management of the rest of the composting process and how to optimize it via monitoring and record keeping. It also discusses the importance of curing, suggestions for using finished compost, and health and safety considerations. The most rapid composting happens when you start with a balanced, thoroughly mixed recipe, which we've already discussed, regularly turn or aerate your pile, and monitor and, and adjust the moisture content as needed. After you've built your composting pile, the temperature should reach the thermophilic range within a few days of being built. The thermophilic range is between 105 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Compost should remain in this range for a few weeks, and this is considered the active composting stage. Ideally, you would remix or turn the pile two to three times a week during this phase. As the process continues, turning can be reduced to a weekly schedule. At the least, turning active compost piles uh, should be done when the temperature nears 165 degrees Fahrenheit to avoid killing off your microbes. These high temperatures are more likely to happen where large amounts of food scraps or animal wastes are being composted. When you turn a pile, your goal should be to move what, is, what was on the outside of the pile to the middle and rebuilding the pile by moving the materials into a new spot beside where the original, beside the original pile may be the most thorough way of doing this. If using a bin system, pulling out the material into a mixing bin or onto a tarp or a concrete pad and then rebuilding the pile when it's nice and mixed is a good way is also a good way to do this. We, off, we offer more detail on achieving a thorough mix in the report. Regularly mixing or turning a pile and tracking temperatures, odors, moisture, and pest pressure are good practices for any composter. Use compost thermometers to gauge and record temperatures. Use your senses, your nose, your eyes, and the hand squeeze test to observe odor levels, moisture content, and pest activity throughout the composting process. Do this daily until you acquire a feel for the process. Keep, your rec keep records of your observations and al allow these measurements and observations to guide the process. A pattern should emerge after several batches of materials have been composted. Keeping records will allow you to observe trends that will inform adjustments that you may need to make along the, along the course of your composting process. A sample data tracking sheet to keep track of this information is provided in Appendix D of the report. These monitoring and record keeping practices should be required should be required for sites processing animal manures and food scraps from more than one household or producing compost for sale or food production. Uh, strong odors may be a sign that something is wrong and need to be dealt with Im immediately. We offer troubleshooting resources in Appendix B and D of the report. Water. Water may need to be added during uh, the composting process to your, com to your composting files, especially if your feedstocks are dry. And during turnings or mixings throughout the active phase uh, when temperatures are higher. Once decomposition slows and returns to the mesophilic phase or less than 105 degrees Fahrenheit, microbes will need less water and you'll not need to add as much. When you're adding material to your composting system or checking on the composting process, this is also a good time to check for animal activity, where uh, animal pressure from rodents, where pressure from rodents is great, such as in urban areas, uh, it's important to keep an eye out for uh, signs such as burrowing holes or chewing on your system. If you see any of this activity, you need to cut off access to their food immediately and uh, address any hiding places that they might have. 
the heat produced during the composting process is directly related to the level of microbial activity. And for this reason, temperature is a useful measurement for assessing the health of the composting process. This is a useful visualization of the phases of thermophilic composting that was recreated from the composting in the classroom uh, book uh, that we created for this report. It shows the standard temperature curve you can expect from your composting pile. It's worth noting that the most rapid decomposition takes place between 122 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit, but certain seeds are only killed at slightly higher temperatures. All right, according to the US Composting Council, because food residuals have high moisture content and due to the system in which human foods are produced, they are at higher risk of containing human pathogens, fungi, and bacteria. For these reasons, it's really important that sites processing animal, animal manures and food scraps from more than one household or producing compost for sale or food production monitor temperatures and follow the process to further reduce pathogens, or PFRP. This is a time temperature protocol. And basically, it means that compost processing time and temperatures should be, should be sufficient to kill most weed seeds and reduce pathogens such as E. coli or salmonella. This also prevents vector attractions, uh, vector attraction from unwa unwanted critters. To meet PFRP, material composted in enclosed systems must be maintained at a minimum average temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit or higher for three continuous days. Passively aerated or window style piles need to be kept uh, at a minimum average temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit or higher for at least 15 days, but they don't always need to be consecutive. You'll have to check with your state regular regulators to be sure. During this period, there must be a minimum of five turnings with a minimum of three days between turnings. Created this handy table to try to digest that information a little bit more clearly. Um, but basically to kill off persistent weed and otherwise unwanted seeds, um, we also further recommend 153 degrees Fahrenheit as the target temperature. Um, it's, an important to, it's also important to note that everything in your pile must hit these temperatures. That means that you have to stop adding material before you start measuring your temperatures. So um, managing the composting process also requires that you be ready to manage problems that may arise. Uh, this may involve being ready to cut off or divert food scrap deliveries if problems arise. These may include complaints from neighbors or regulators, rodent infestations, shortage of brown materials, or an existence of other unmanageable nuisances. Composting should stop until these problems can be fixed. This means you should not accept new material or build new piles. If animals have burrowed in any of your composting piles, including piles that are curing or finished, this material is now contaminated and should likely be disposed of. This is particularly true for rodent infestations. However, if you suspect only minimal animal activity, the material in question can be mixed with, fresh, with a fresh pile so that the material can be recomposted to hit PFRP temperatures. It can also be solarized. We do offer more information about that um, in the report. After your compost pile has passed through the active composting phase, there are a few final steps that you need to take before you have a finished product that's ready to be added to soil. This section outlines these steps. Curing allows the aerobic decomposition or composting process to gradually come to a close to produce a chemically stable, plant-friendly finished product. During the stage, pH is neutralized, the humus concentration increases and the ability of the compost to store nutri nutrients also increases. Weeks to months after a pile has been built, the temperature will return to the mesophilic range. Compost is ready for curing when it no longer has recognizable food scraps and the pile no longer heats up beyond 104 degrees Fahrenheit after turning. At this point, a diverse array of microbes repopulate the compost pile and we want it to stay that way. They will need some water, though not as much as be uh, before, and they will still need plenty of air. A minimum of four weeks is needed for curing, but two to four months is recommended. Adding unfinished compost or incompletely decomposed material to a garden bed is not recommended. Uh, An unfinished compost bacteria compete with plants for nitrogen in the soil, 
uh, as they continue to consume oxygen. This reduces the availability of oxygen to plant roots and can also, uh, unfinished compost can also contain high levels of organic acids. All of these factors are bad for plants and can stunt their growth. So how do you know when your compost is ready to be used? Completely finished compost is dark, brown, earthy smelling, uh, similar to rich organic soil. It's homogenous and is within 10 degrees Fahrenheit of ambient temperature. Original feedstocks that you put into your composting pile should not be recognizable, with the exception of a few wood chips or twigs, but these can be screened out and re-entered into a new pile. Um, regular compost quality testing is recommended for any site that is producing compost for sale, creating compost for food production, not including if you're using it in your personal garden, um, or accepting materials that have the potential for pathogens, such as manures, meats, large amounts of food scraps, from off-site. In order for compost to be ready for use, it needs to be mature. For assessing the maturity of a given batch of compost, the U.S. Composting Council recommends conducting at least one test each for stability and fitness for use. Stability refers to how much energy-rich feedstocks remain for composting microbes to consume and whether or not it's still being actively decomposed. Fitness for use refers to the level of free ammonia and volatile organic acids precedent present in the compost. These substances are released during the decomposition process and make immature compost phytotoxic or toxic to plants. The Ziploc test is a quick and dirty test for gauging compostability. Uh, in this test, you take a handful of moist compost, put it in a plastic Ziploc baggie, close it, and store it in a dark place for three days. Uh, once that three days have passed, you take out your bag, smell it immediately upon opening, and if you smell ammonia, the compost is not yet finished. Um, if this is the case, give it more time to cure before testing again. This test is obviously not very official. It's pretty subjective, so it should only be the first step in your compost testing procedure. Another test that you can do at your site is called the seed germination bioassay test for phytotoxicity. And this involves taking a plate, adding a layer of your compost, and a new packet of seeds planting them in the compost and watering gently. Uh, you have to keep track of how many seeds you planted so that in a few days when the plants have sprouted, you can compare the germination rate with the rate printed on your packet or the average germination rate that you can find online. If nothing grows, your compost is, is not providing a hospitable environment for plants. However, if you have a good growth rate, you likely have some good compost on your hands. Uh, in the report, we discuss uh, a few other tests that you can do uh, in the field or at your uh, uh, composting site. Um, we also offer a little bit more information on the U.S. Composting Council's STA compost testing program. So check the report out for more information on that. All right. So community composting sites play a special role in engaging the communities that they serve. It's important to be intentional about protecting the well-being of staff, participants, and other visitors. By enacting best management practices, we help to create a safer working environment for anyone coming into contact with your site. However, even at composting sites where BMPs are strictly instituted, potential hazards still exist. You have to take the time to identify them and create basic operating procedures to manage them. In addition, clear and open communication with staff and volunteers is really important for many reasons. Make sure people feel comfortable to proactively communicate any safety concerns relate, related to the composting site to help avoid potential issues. Perhaps a locked gate or adjusted volunteer hours to avoid evening times will help participants feel and be safer. Perhaps animal activity at the site has reached a critical point and composting has to be halted until the problem can be solved. Trained staff and participants are an asset to any community composting project let them know you appreciate them by being prepared to act on their concerns in a meaningful way as soon as possible. As we've already discussed, microbes are the workforce of the composting process, and we are specifically cultivating a hospitable environment for them in our composting piles. These microbes belong at the composting site, not on your hands, clothes, shoes, uh, so that they can be transported elsewhere. Anyone handling composting feedstocks or actively composting piles sh should wear gloves. Anyone with cuts and abrasions should cover them with waterproof bandages and wear nitrile gloves under regular gardening gloves. 
Composters and gardeners should always wash their hands with soap and warm water after handling composting materials, finished compost, soil, or tools before eating, using cell phones, or handling fresh produce, or anything else that will be consumed by others. Composting tools should be rinsed after use and should not be used for gardening. Uh, here pictured, you can see uh, tools at Red Hook Community Farm that are specifically designated for the compost uh, composting operation as designated by the lime green tape. Um, Bioaerosols are basically microbes suspended in air and they are present on composting sites. Uh, another potential area of concern are diseases carried by rodents. Um, they can be contracted by breathing in the dust that is contaminated with rodent urine or droppings, by having direct contact with urine droppings, or by having direct contact with soil or water that has been directly in infected. If your site has active burrowing or fresh urine or droppings, any materials on your site could potentially be infected. These materials should be disposed of immediately. Active burrows require, also require immediate attention to make your site inhospitable to rodents. You do not want to make them feel comfortable. If the problem cannot be remedied quickly, pest management professionals should be contacted. The New York Compost Project hosted by the Lower East Side Ecology Center recommends the following personal protective equipment. Gloves to protect hands from cuts, scrapes, and hygienic contamination. Overshoes to protect boots when navigating through standing water and contact water. Steel-toe steel toe boots to protect feet from injuries due to rolling or falling, uh, falling objects and equipment. Coveralls to prevent bio, bio aerosols and dust that can collect on clothing from being transported off site and to protect staff from extreme cold weather. Protective goggles or a full face visor to protect eyes and face um, and a respiratory mask to protect lungs from sawdust, <clears throat> bio aerosols and aspergillus fumigatus, excuse me. <clears throat> a respiratory mask to protect lungs from sawdust, bio aerosols, and Aspergillus fumigatus, which is a common, common fungal spore. These are particularly important for anyone with allergies, asthma, a weakened immune system, or people who are prone to infection. Earplugs um, are also valuable to protect ears from loud equipment and tools. And with that, I think I am done. Yay, Linda. Wow, that was a lot to cover, so great job. And we're gonna take questions now. I know people, some people have to go at the top of the hour, um, which is fine, but we are available for the next 30 minutes to answer questions. And before we do that, we're just gonna run three polls, three questions, just to get us, um, see how you're doing. So um, Virginia will run those. The first question is, do you, already implement any of the BMPs outlined um, in the webinar, the report at your site in your operations? Of course, only answer if you're running a community scale operation. So um, many of the BMPs, some, very few, none. And we'd like to try to get to 75% of you voting and we're at 36%, but I know not everybody's running a site. So, um, let's show the results. So 38% of you, 40% voted, and the results are okay. 45% 40, of you have, have implemented many of these already, 45% have implemented some, and 9% very few, but good. I like to see none, 0%. Okay, next question. How inclined are you to start implementing the BMPs outlined in this report. So your options are very much, somewhat, not very. And meanwhile, um, feel free, keep the in your question panel, uh, uh, write in your, um, your questions. You can keep them coming. We have a few already. All right, let's show the results. Okay, good. Good job, Linda, 92%. They're very much going to implement your BMPs. Okay, I'd like to know uh, for the eight percent somewhat. So you'll have to let us know where you're at and what your challenges are. Okay, last question. As an intro to best management practices, let us know how useful this webinar has been in in terms of did it have too much information, the right amount, not enough. We can't tell who you are, so just be honest. Okay, it's looking like 
let's see if we can get beyond 50% voting. The votes are still coming in. I'm not seeing the numbers change so much, so let's just share the results. And I keep talking about Virginia. Virginia's our colleague. Thank you, Virginia. She's all the tech support here. All right, 71%, just the right amount of information. Okay, thanks for participating. All right, so now we're going to um, address uh, some of the uh, questions that have uh, come in. And um, uh, one of them, and I'm going to focus on the ones that deal with BMPs first. So um, we had a question is, how dry can we get compost? to make screening easier, 40%. And Linda, I'm just gonna start off by, by saying that this is a great question because even at commercial industrial scale composting sites, compost that is too wet is an issue. And often, you know, we uh, composters love to screen compost to a quarter inch finished compost, but often settle for three eighths of an inch because if it's too wet, you know, it plugs the screen and there's the commercial scale, there's screens with rotating brushes. So you don't really want it to be too wet. But to answer your question, you were right, Sharon Crew, 40%, you really want your finished compost to have 40 to 50% moisture. And I do recommend letting it fully cure before you compost, or the, I mean, before you screen. You can screen before it's cured, but there's many reasons not to, not only moisture, but you know the curing piles uh, need oxygen as, as well and leaving um, the wood chips and whatnot in there helps with that. So Linda, I don't know if you want to add to that, but just thought I would jump in. Nope, I think you covered it pretty well. Yep. And you know, you can shake, you can, you know, there's different screeners available even at the community scale. There's a really robust do-it-yourself small scale trauma rotating screen, you know, kind of community online. And a lot of times you'll see those screens in there their uh, their level, but if you put them at an angle, it can help move the material. You know, use gravity. So, um, and if others on the call, and we will ask, we will tap our community composters to see if others have some insights on this, because I know wet compost is an issue, and there are some sites that actually dry out their compost for a few days, and you know, and then screen it, and then add moisture back in. So people have different different ways of doing this. Um, and I should just say that Linda and I, uh, we're going to do our best to answer your questions, but we wanted to also say at the outset that we're lifelong learners. And so if there's a question we can't answer, we have a wide network to tap and other colleagues. So we'll do our best. Okay. All right. Next question. Um, in ASP systems, or radiated static pile systems, do PVC pipes leach phthalates or other chemicals into compost? And I will just tell you that we don't recommend PVC pipes. We recommend HDPE pipes. And even for larger scale facilities, the um, the uh, the thick wall HDPE pipes are recommended, but they'll work just fine. You don't need PVC pipes. Um, okay, so Linda, here's one for you. If the compost is not germinating in the seed test, is my compost not good? cannot be sold or can the application be different? That's a good question. I would say uh, I am mostly focused on creating compost for food production. Um, that's sort of my lens. And if I had a sample of compost that uh, nothing germinated in, that would basically tell me that my compost is likely not finished. That would be sort of my first guess that maybe it just needs more time to finish curing. Um, but if that doesn't resolve it, um, there are other tests that you can do. One test that I didn't really get to talk about is the Solvita compost maturity test, which is something that even if you were to send your compost away to be tested by a laboratory, it is something that they generally include. And that's something that you can buy online uh, from, uh, I forget who carries the Solvita uh, compost maturity test, but you can just Google that. Um, and six tests are available for about 200 bucks. Um, but for other applications, that's a good question. Um, you might be able to use it for ornamental plants um, and things that, that you're not gonna be uh, mo like too worried about potentially burning. Um, do you have anything to add, Brenda? I'll just say, I think it would be good to, you know, get a sense of why the seeds aren't germinating too. So 
getting um, doing some further testing. It's hard, you know, to give you advice not kind of knowing what's going on, but it could be could be pH, could be you know any number of, of things, um, and including um, I don't know. Linda, if you touched on it or not, but there is a type of herbicide, persistent herbicides, that um, can get into compost and at very, very minute quantities can um, contaminate the compost, like in the parts per billion, and it'll stop seeds from germinating, it'll curl the plants, they won't put out, you know, the flowers, and so there's signs of, um, so that, it could be there's something else going in the compost, and in that case, you know, you have, if it is that you have limited, again, limited applications um, for using it. So it'd be good to kind of find out why. Um, okay, so um, do you have to create a six inch layer of carbon on the bottom and top of pile each time you turn or just on the onset of starting the pile? Well, I would say as much of the time as possible, um, but particularly at the beginning of the, when you have a fresh pile that has fresh feedstocks in it. And of course, this is most important when you have really highly putrescible materials like food scraps and manures in your pile. It's basically acting uh, to, uh, you know, filter any potential odors and any extra moisture. Um, it also insulates so that whatever moisture is in the pile um, stays in the pile, so it does a lot of good things, but the focus really should be on the on the freshest piles when there's still visible feedstocks um, present. Yeah, and I think Linda, you answered this, but um, the, I missed the addition clarification from the um, person who asked this. She clarified on a pile that is already mostly compost before <laughs> it is to be cured, but I think you answered that. Yep. Yes, you, yeah. Um, Okay, so um, we have a few, okay, let's just see, sorry. Um, how do you deal with runoff in your windrows and water collection rules at your facilities? I have seen ponds at other facilities, but my site is under two acres and we cannot do a pond. Hmm. I would say that this is definitely beyond my experience level. Um, I don't have as much experience with windrows, but we would be happy to reach out and find out an answer to that question for you. Yeah, and I can just, you know, add that there's, um, you do wanna find out, as Linda emphasized during the webinar, the local rules that you have for um, a lot of states have um, in their permitting rules for compost sites, exemptions for small scale sites. So if you're a commercial scale site and you're not exempt, there's very strict rules on contact water, and if you have to collect it in a pond and whatnot. Um, one uh, way that I've seen for on-farm composting and small-scale sites that have been exempt is to have, um, you know, a field or, or a, a, a meadow that can act as kind of a natural biofilter, if you will. So you don't need a pond if you're small-scale, but definitely check into your state rules on this. Um, the other thing you can do is to minimize, quote, contact water is you can cover your windrows. You can, you know, put it under a roof, even if it's an uh, open side, open sides. Um, you saw pictures of the um, ASP system in um, under the Queensboro Bridge in uh, New York City, and those those are covered with the Gore um, Gore cover system. So there's different things you can do to help, you know, prevent the problem even to begin with. Um, and there are some uh, good resources on best management practices. Okay, so um, thoughts about integrating compost systems into permaculture installations for growing annuals. We think there might be some good opportunities to use hugel culture for food waste composting, but don't know where to start. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm not sure if they mean uh, burying food scraps like you do, uh, as I understand it, Hugo culture, Hugo culture is basically putting, uh, I've seen big tree branches and uh, big pieces of wood basically being buried underground. Um, and then that sort of slowly decomposes. Um, I would be, I would feel uncomfortable 
with uh, ditch composting or putting food scraps sort of in a big pile and then burying them. Um, that probably doesn't qualify as a BMP, particularly in uh, urban environments, um, but that's not something that uh, that I've researched very carefully. Yeah, and I'll just add, I agree with Linda. I think if you're in an urban environment where there may be, and a lot of urban environments have existing rat pressure or rodent pressure, and a lot of cities are actually seeing that increase with um, climate change. So just be careful about if you're talking about, you know, not using actual compost made from food scraps, but burying. Uh, we The webinar, Linda referred to it, the Bokashi, Bokashi webinar we did, where you have that pre-treatment through the fermentation Bokashi system is a way, and one of our speakers, uh, Vandra from Bokashi in New York, she does do a lot of trench, uh, um, Bokashi systems. So check check that out. There you may get um, some interesting um, ideas and whatnot um, related to that. Um, let's see. Good questions. Keep them coming. Okay. Compostability test. Uh, compostability testings. Uh, DWAR a 15 day test and respiration a five day test. Can the result differ? If so. What makes that happen? <laughs> this is a, <laughs> yeah, that's a we'll that's have a to get question. back to you on that. So, mm -hmm. Gowry, we will get back to you on the compostability testing and the difference. Um, okay, what is the best seed to use to do a bioassay on compost? Uh, I've heard watercress is good. Um, for some reason, it seems to be particularly sensitive to compost, uh, like immature compost, um, but I've definitely seen people use radish seeds. Uh, I think a lot of farms have radish seeds available. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, so we had some questions about, um, I'm not seeing more BMP related questions, so I'm just gonna go to some of the general ones. Um, we had one, um, uh, does the guidebook also include rules in other states? The short answer is no, just Georgia. Um, but as I mentioned at the top of the hour, we have a new uh, composting for community map where we include state policies. And there is a number of states that have those uh, permit exemptions for on-farm composting or small-scale sites. And so we have links to those um, policies. So if you're in a state that has no policy or exemptions, uh, for community scale composting. This could be a resource, not that all the policies are good, mind you, but just you, so you can see uh, what other states are doing in this, this arena. Um, we had another question, who pays the community composters? The community? And that's a good question. It depends. There's no one type of community composting operation. Mm -hmm. I will share that um, I think New York City is a leader in supporting community scale composting through, they've had for probably 20 years now, a master composter training program. And there's something like 250 community compost sites in all the boroughs in New York City. And a number of those are host sites, the New York Compost Project host sites at Governor's Island, Lower East Side Ecology Center. Um, some of them are botanical gardens and they're this, the city, the Department of Sanitation, is actually supporting not only the training programs and the demonstration sites, but paying for staff at those often nonprofit organizations to run those programs. Uh, the city also pays ha under contract with Grow NYC to run food scrap collection programs at something like 50 farmers markets throughout the city. And uh, Grow NYC not only does the collection, but they're also at some of the community compost sites doing the processing for the material. So New York City is a great, a great model. In DC, um, the DC uh, Department of Public Works has contracted with Compost Cab to collect food scraps at its farm, at a number of farmers markets, and Compost Cab is also doing some of the processing. Uh, the DC Department of Parks and Recs is supporting 56 community compost operations throughout the District of Columbia, but a lot of the sites are run by volunteers. So we have a number of community composters, for-profit, worker-owned cooperatives. 
uh, in our network and a number of them not only are doing composting but doing the collection so um, independent from government support we do recommend government support by the way support your community composters but um but they're 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 making um you know it a financial sustainable financial enterprise by collecting fees for the collection from households and businesses that are setting out their food scraps and other materials so um let's see and do we yeah i'll go ahead. just add to that um i think that uh it, oftentimes at community gardens and urban farms composting sort of this extra um thing that people try to make happen with uh, you know it's not necessarily a priority and i think that just getting to a point where uh it is more of a central uh, priority, so maybe it's something that that nonprofit uh, fundraises uh, around supporting, paying somebody to manage it, um, or whether um, you know you can find ways of offsetting costs. Uh, like if you're having to buy compost um, for your garden or your farm, uh, maybe you can instead pay somebody to um, to manage the composting uh, system on your site. Um, I think that there's just smaller ways you know, separate from creating a whole business um, to collect food scraps or something like that. So I think there's smaller ways of just making sure that we can pay people for their time and doing this kind of uh, work of love. Yes, good. Um, oh, Eric Martig, thank you, Eric, has added to the answer on what kind of seeds are good for um, testing. And Eric, by the way, used to run the uh, big reuse composting site under the um, Queensboro Bridge and helped um, review this report. So one of our advisors. So Eric says cucumber is also used due to salt sensitivity. So check that out. That's Thanks, enough. Eric. Um, OK, so um, uh, when states require compact clay or concrete for composting facility service surface, and you add mulch on bottom and bio cover all over. How do you avoid changing your 30 to one ratio in the active pile? So the question is more about the how, how you not mix in the bio cover on the bottom. Is that right? Yeah, you're adding mulch and carbon on the bottom and all over. So isn't that mm -hmm. going to change your 30 to one ratio in your active pile? Uh, that's a really good question and a good observation, and it and it will if it if that material gets mixed in. Um, so it, that does take some experimentation. Um, I think you know ideally if you can scoop on top of that layer um, as much as possible so that you're not mixing everything in. I think that that is helpful, but that's not always feasible. Um, so it's just something that you're going to have to kind of plan into your recipe. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you find that you've ended up with too much carbon uh, in your first pile, maybe in the next pile, you sort of mix in a little bit less brown into your mix with the assumption that when you mix your pile in a few days that it will get incorporated because of that. So it's sort of a, that's where the art comes in. Good. Um... Uh, by the way, if you're looking at your, I'm, I'm not sure for the question panel here, but somebody, uh, Lorenzo, thank you, shared a link to a YouTube for one of the rotating trammels that he said he loves. So uh, I just shared it so everybody could see it. So if you want that link. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's quite a do-it-yourself online community for building trammel screens. Um, all right, so I don't know if uh, about if we can answer this, but we can punt it to any, to, to others. But anyone using biochar? Question mark. Any thoughts, Linda? Mm, it's something that I've only tangentially heard about, and I haven't like researched very directly myself, so I probably don't have any insights. Okay. And I know uh, Benny Ares at Eco City Farms. We've shouted out to him several times. He's um, he he's uh, doing and using a, a biochar, so um, we can follow up on that. All right. So the um, uh, we're I think we've addressed all the questions. So we've got just one last one that we haven't addressed. Um, so if you have others, type them in. Um, so 
does ILSR help change regulations around composting in Midwest towns that are struggling to keep up with the coast? We could, we, we could use all the help here. So Justin Campbell, thanks for that question. We would love to help you. Um, and so we do have um, a, a policy, legal and, and policy project to support community composters that we have joined with the Sustainable Economies Law Center, which is based out on the West Coast. And having folks like you uh, with need will, Help, you know, we want to meet your needs, so let's we'll follow up with you and anybody else who needs help. Um, uh, we'll see what we can do to help and share stuff with you. So, okay, we got a few more questions that have come in. So, oh, here's an answer to the biochar. Thanks for uh, jumping in, Meredith. Um, Mo Organic in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, is utilizing biochar in mixes with traditional compost, able to sell it to consumers at premium. So there you go. Um, and then Lorenzo, does ILSR have literature pamphlets to assist in promoting local community composting? Uh, we have some resources. We have, um, I think uh, Linda showed it, we have some posters, uh, including our hierarchy that shows the importance of scale. It's the only food waste reduction hierarchy that we've seen that has this lens of keeping it local as part of the priority and hierarchy. We also have um, um, a number of um, other posters and infographics along with our growing local fertility guide. So if there's something you need in particular, we'd love to hear about it so we can meet the needs that are out there. And another question. Okay, here's one, Linda, I'll punt this one to you. What about paper towels? Can they be used like newspapers? Mm, well, uh, I put um, new uh, paper towels that aren't, you know, that I didn't use to like clean up grease or something like that. Um, I do put them in my compost. Um, you do want to shred them up, but um, putting too much paper in your comp, you don't want to just do paper towels or anything like that, or just newspapers in your composting mix if you can avoid it. Um, in particular, uh, it's, you know, it creates sort of, uh, it's kind of like using leaves where um, if you don't have a, a less dense um, material to kind of balance it out with, it can uh, mat down and create anaerobic pockets. Um, but then there is also some concerns about paper that Brenda, I'll let you explain. Yeah, well, I'll just say, you know, be careful about the source. I mean, if you're sourcing paper towels from some, you know, university bathroom or something like that, there could be other things in there, including, you know, needles um, in there. So just like with any of your feedstocks, know where it's coming from. In the pile itself, you know, um, paper, you know, it, it, like with newspaper, you don't want to just put the newspaper, you have to like rip it and shred it. And so, so you're not blocking the airflow and creating these layers that just, you know, don't allow the, the flow of the air and the, and the oxygen to flow in your pile, which is really critical. So just be aware of that. But, um, and then, um, you know, I think what Linda may have been alluding with other paper products like, um, uh, food service wear items like chinette plates and things like that. There's been um, uh, PFOAs, kind of uh, basically um, Teflon coatings found in a lot of those that have been added either on purpose or inadvertently to help with grease resistance on those food service wear products. So at um, the, the group, the Biodegradable Products Institute is updating its third party certification for compostability, which should be implemented next year to um, avoid those type of materials and products if you're gonna earn the certification. But right now, those products could have them. So at the community site that I manage, we have banned food service, compostable food service wear items except for bio bags. Um, so that's just something just to be aware of and there, we can send you some information if you want more um, on that. Um, Lorenzo had a follow-up question about the resources. Do we need permission to use these in our community? We have made all of our posters available under the common, I forget what it's called, common 
you know, use license and we have some suggested language, we would love to get credit. That's all we ask for. But we produce this these um, graphics for you to use. So please, please use them. And thanks for asking. And on that note, too, I'll just share that the illustrations um, that we have done with this report, we've also on our landing page for the report have made the illustrations available individually for you to use. A lot of them were in this PowerPoint, but please feel free to use them. Again, we just ask that you give us credit. Um, and the lang suggested language for crediting us is on, on our website. And just okay. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I, I apologize in advance if I missed your question. And um, again, thank you to my colleagues, Virginia, for doing the tech support on the webinar, and to Linda for um, presenting on the webinar and for all of you to staying to the very end. We appreciate it. If there's a topic that you're interested in, you want us to feature, let us know. Uh, we, again, we're want to support a diverse and distributed infrastructure for composting that starts at the local level. And we'd like to meet the needs out there and work together to uh, grow grow the sector. And please, please come to New York City. Again, you only, our registration for our National Cultivating Community Composting Forum ends today at midnight. So again, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we will see you on the next one. Thanks everyone.